Hi there, this is David Hayden Jones, the actor who plays Mr. Ketch on Supernatural, and you are listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to an experimental episode of Neil Before Pod. I'm your host, Craig McKenzie, and this is new for us. Since Neil Before Blog is largely an analysis review site, we've decided to try doing this as a group with the new Fox slash Marvel show that sort of spins off from the X-Men universe, but not really, called Legion. Before we get started, here's a brief word from James Lundy, who runs the friendly rival podcast Hero Talk Rebirth, and is the head guy behind Edinburgh Comic Con. If you don't live locally and have no idea what Edinburgh Comic Con is, then just skip ahead two minutes. Dad, when Comic Con? Well, it's no long movie, man. I'll be on the 15th and 16th of April 2017. But where is it? Ah, it's the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, the DICC, which is just on Morrison Street in the centre of the city, about four minutes from uh, Haymarket train station. Uh, you get the tram just in the bottom of the road, and sort of parking close by as well. Free parking in the streets on Sunday, so uh, very amicable. Who's going to be there? Or well, who's going to be there? Ah, we've got loads of guests. We've got uh, if you call, the comic books, we've got Ken Lashley, we've got Gary Brown, Emma Beebe, Phil Jimenez, Gordon Rennie, Matthew Clark, James Haran, John Lees, Chris Minihum, Monty Michael Moore, Dan McDade, and a whole lot more. For film and TV guests, we've got an exclusive first-time uh, UK or, or European appearance of AMC's Comic Book Men. Uh, they know the show that's on uh, just after The Walking Dead on Sunday night. We have uh, Zara Fithian, who was in like Doctor Strange, Neil Finglan, who's been in Game of Thrones, Doctor Who, 47 Ronin, Age of Ultron, uh, X-Men First Class, to name but a few, Richard O'Fill for Star Wars, Andrew Lee Potts for Prime Evil, and uh, Stanley's Lucky Man, uh, Claudia Christian, who's been in Babylon 5, and just recently um, Call of Duty and from the Warfare. Uh, there have been more to be on, so just keep a wee eye on our social media on the website. What else? Oh, there'll be loads of attractions, all the panels and talks, they'll be free, there'll be a photo booth, there'll be props to get your photos taken with. Oh, and and there'll be also, there'll be an an exclusive first time uh, in the UK screening of uh, Shooting Clerks, you know, the the Kevin Smith biopic. Uh, It's brilliant, like award-winning biopic film, so that's something that's definitely a nice draw for the Sunday. Keep on asking me that as we get further and further and closer to the time. And where can we get tickets? Oh, tickets? Ah, of course, well, you can get tickets online, uh, basically from the main website, which is heroconventions.com, uh, www.heroconventions.com. Yeah, get them through Tickerweb, delivered straight to your door. Yippee! That's my sentiments exactly, you man. Can't wait. So, that was James. If you happen to be able to get to Edinburgh, then do come along to Edinburgh Comic Con. It promises to be a really fun event with all the nerdy stuff you could ask for. Dust off your cosplay and check it out. I'll be there, but don't let that put you off. So without further ado, let's get this started. Joining me this week is Aaron. Hello. And Chris. Hello. Who I have on good authority have watched Legion. And indeed, perhaps remember it. I'm prepared to commit to that, yes. I cannot confirm nor deny the statement. Yeah, it's going to be a real short conversation if none of us (laughs) paid attention. Okay, so... um, We've never reviewed a show like this before. I mean, we've done TV stuff in the past where we've kind of caught up on the, the half seasons or the full seasons, but we've never actually discussed a show in its entirety, so or episodes in their entirety. So how are people feeling about this sort of thing? Personally, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say anything otherwise. To say anything <laughs> else would seem bad. So let's go with that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris, do you want to bring us down? You know, bring us back to Earth with a more cynical comment. No, I think it's going to be the best thing we've ever done. Yes, the best thing we've ever done. Ever. And it'd be interesting if it turns out to be shorter than the episode, because that would be new for us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so uh, Legion, it's not that film about angels that I've never actually seen. Good. Nor the TV show based on it. Good. um, Nor is it any other thing with Legion in the title, which there seems to be a lot of. So... This is kind of, sort of, but not really almost based in the X-Men universe. It has music Isn't it, and stuff. Didn't they sort of commit to it being X-Men by putting an X over the zero in the credits? 
think that's more down to brand recognition than anything Is else. Because, right, okay. You know, based on anything pe- anyone says, I mean, I'm trying not to spoil anything, but based on anything people say in this given episode is that there's nothing um no connection to the films in any way you know mutants seem to be relatively unheard of they did use the word mutant though so that can't yeah. be someone knocked knows out that. by some yeah. law or yeah contract or whatever yeah but we'll get into that when we discuss spoilers but for yeah. now i mean what were, the, what were the initial thoughts on this opening episode you know um chris do you want to go first what did you think um, I thought the opening of it was uh, confusing in a fun way. It sort of uh, plays with your perception a little bit. Um, it was quite surprising in the way it opened. Um, obviously, it's a spoiler-free section, so I'm not going to spoil anything. But um, it seemed like quite a good opener from the from the third quarter, if you know what I'm saying about <laughs> it. Kind of properly kicks in uh, where the first Brit left me just a tad confused yeah Aaron what did you think uh, I, I, I actually really enjoyed this Be, for, for one reason alone that anybody that I've spoken to too often about these things will just be bored of hearing but there's a tendency sometimes I think for people when they introduce you to shows to say uh, yeah it, it, it's good but when only when you get to like episode 4 you have to give it a few episodes and I always say no you don't I refuse to do homework to get into these <laughs> shows and um, with this show I was cooked in from the start I said it was a great first episode and I, I'm prepared to believe that that's really difficult to do so I um, so I think that yeah that's, that's an achievement by itself yeah. yeah. Second thing I thought that is for me, and I know this is not going to be a prevailing opinion, but for me, this pretty much brings Marvel to the point where I think they own the TV and the film now. And I know that's not going to be true for, for, for you guys, but I, know, but I could happily just watch Marvel now and don't need any DC anymore. Except Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, I yeah, I dislike that show so strongly. I could <laughs> I definitely need to watch that so I know how much I hate it. Yeah, okay. I will. <laughs> you have to take yeah. the bad with the good if you're going to commit to a universe. Yeah, you know, you take everything that comes with it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Can we can we say ninety percent of it then is everything <laughs> I want, but yeah, I admit um Fortunately we don't live in a totalitarian state where you can you know, where you're you have to pick T V shows and stick to them so you can watch whatever you want. Yeah, Marvel or DC, there's room for everyone to get along. We can all be friends, it's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, um, I enjoyed it as well. Uh, In terms of superhero shows, it's a lot more deliberately paced than I'm used to. You know, but I watch things like The Flash or Arrow, where it blows through plot over 45 minutes to kind of varying degrees of success. So I'm kind of used to a much faster way of storytelling. So that was a bit of a personal adjustment for me. I never had a problem with it, but I was. Yeah, I found the first third of the episode a bit slow going. You know, I was, I was always kind of intrigued, but I was kind of waiting for something to happen for a bit. But I did I did enjoy it for the most part. Um, I think um, I think the second episode will be really telling about how the show is actually going to be because the first episode is important in setting things up. I always feel like the second episode is the most important because it's always that's the first episode of the show, really. Well, I wonder actually with that second episode, still avoiding the spoilers, if it's going to change quite considerably. And actually, that would be a big problem for me because they've managed to set up a a show that has a totally different feel than a lot of the more basically styled superhero stuff where it is a guy or a girl or a group of people who are going up against a villain of the week And it feels like this one opened with something that was completely different to that stylistically and plot wise. Obviously, I'll leave the details to it later, but still, it feels like they've gone for for something that might be difficult to then keep on through the whole season. As in, how are they going to keep that style up? Especially when we might be expecting or even needing it to go into a more episodic villain of the week thing. if that's what the if that's what the fans call for, well, I mean it doesn't have to because, as I understand it, it was um, developed as an eight episode season. So you know it's kind of 
a, a long, I guess it can be a long form story told over eight episodes. I'm told that the showrunner's previous show, Fargo, was was a bit like that. It was kind of every episode was important in this overarching plot, and I get the impression that that's happening here. Whereas if you look at something like The Flash, um, there is an overarching plot, but every episode has to kind of be its own thing as well. Especially when you have twenty, twenty three of them. To, you know, so there's a certain amount of killing time there, but with eight, you can be a bit more punchy and a bit more uh, succinct in the way you, you tell your story. So it doesn't have to be this kind of who is he fighting this week sort of thing. I really hope they do that because I want this to be a different style. I want them to carry on with what I think I've been promised in the first episode. So I look forward to it being that. I've seen Fargo and I know what style you mean. It's Mad Men style where it's just a continuous story. I, yeah. I definitely want to see that, I think. Yeah, serialization as opposed to um, as opposed to episodic. episodic. Yeah, I think that style that you're talking about. I don't know if either of you have watched Mr. Robot at all, but yes. they managed to keep that similar style going through the entire season without particularly uh, wrecking it for you or switching the format. So I, I think they would be able to keep it going in a way for eight episodes at least. Yeah, or something like Breaking Bad as well, which is broadly. Uh, broadly serialized with every episode kind of contributing to a larger whole in some way. So, you know, there's that that kind of style of programming seems to be what they're aiming for here. Based on this one episode, everything could change this week, but we don't know. Unless anybody has anything else that's vaguely detailed, we could just jump straight into spoilers and just start tearing this thing apart. Carry on. Are you okay with jumping into spoiler territory, Chris? Let's go for it. So, I guess we should talk about story and character. I mean, in a show like this, they seem to be intrinsically linked. You know, the the story is entirely centred around the, the David character because it's all from his perspective. So, I guess we just talk about uh, David as as a plot device, I suppose. I mean, he's the plot all revolves around him. And, uh, so, David as a character, uh, what do we learn about him in this episode and what... What does he do and what is what makes him tick? I think the fun aspect is we don't know yet. <laughs> unless yeah. you've unless you've read the the comics or some of the background material, which I've tried to avoid so far. Oh, I know who Legion is in the comics and it isn't this guy. Yeah, so, so I I don't you know, I don't really know at this point because you sort of your view of the character has been warped so many times through the episodes that you're not too sure, really. Yeah, we get the impression he's a telepath and he's telekinetic, but mm. not much else. But that's his powers rather than who yeah. he is, and I think that's one of the things that is that is interesting about this this choice of of Marvel to go with is to really focus on a, a personal story rather than on 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 the power itself. Which I think they did start with. Um, uh, what's the one before Luke Cage? Oh, damn it, my memory. Jessica awful. Jones. Jessica Jones and Luke Cage have have definitely stepped out into that area, but this has really pushed it to that extreme, and that's a good thing. So the focus is really on the fact that he is somebody who thinks he's mad, but clearly really isn't. He's just confused. Um, And I I definitely got that impression, because when you're watching him in in the hospital, he's so rational. Uh, points he clearly gets overwhelmed and he clearly gets very stressed yeah but he is not in any way uh completely insane which is what i thought i was probably going to get when i did a little bit of reading online beforehand um, yeah i'm not 100 percent sure of marvel as a creative entity of anything to do with this other than you know I'm, not. I'm not sure it's hard to tell uh, it's definitely a Fox thing, and Fox own the X Men, which is where the character is allowed to be used. And uh, the Marvel logo is on there, I think, but I don't think I'm not sure if they have any involvement in it or not, because um, they're not allowed to use mutants in Marvel shows. So I think it's, I don't think it's even set in the X Men universe, to be honest. I think it's just set in a universe where there happens to be mutants. Do you um, think that's a confidence thing, where if it goes well over eight episodes, they'll potentially do a further tie-in, where they're not really wanting to associate with it until it's a proven product? Yeah, well, I mean, do you think the X-Men films are set in the same universe? 
Yeah, you know, I, I certainly don't. Well, they could go that way, though, based on the background, because they've made it very clear that the government is the enemy, yeah. and the mutants themselves are having to hide out for their own defense. Whether they end up being good, as it were, or not, we don't know. But still, they've got that 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 same background plot that could easily be constructed by any number of these time restarts that we've had in the films. Mm. Yeah, I think um, David's going back to him as a character. I think he's a really interesting character, and I quite like the whole uh, he thinks he's mentally ill angle because he doesn't know he doesn't know how to resolve his own powers. So he thinks that everything that's happening to him couldn't possibly be real, even though obviously it is because there's powers starting to manifest. Which makes me think the whole mutant thing isn't well known in this world because, you know, if you if you know that mutants exist and you suddenly start hearing people's thoughts and your first thought should maybe be, maybe I'm a telepath. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Yeah. They don't they don't have a nobody mentions it. Nobody is accidentally brings it up in conversation. Nobody talks about oh, did you see that guy blow up that building the other day? It's yeah, it's not in there at all. So they've kept just, it hidden. Remember that guy that lifted a football stadium and put it around the White House. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. But they, um, so they I think given it sorry. a time period. Sorry, uh, have they given it a time period yet? Have they said it's sixties or seventies? The aesthetics very sort of seventies, isn't it's it? Definitely seventies. Yeah. yeah. But there is kind of modern conveniences in there, isn't there? I mean, oh, that's yeah, that's one of the weirdest things actually. When you see the interrogator come in with this two-page iPad, and yeah. it was such a massive shock that part of me thought. Was it going to be some form of hallucination? Was one or the other the hallucination? It was the seventies not real, or was the modern day stuff not real? But I think it's it feels like by the end of the episode that it's it's that there is this hardware that is in the hands of the powerful. Mm. You know, the, the the advanced kit is by it by the people who can get it, but with everybody else, the normal Joe blogs on the street is still is still dealing with what own, what is only in the seventies. Yeah, it, it's very kind of comic booky and it's aesthetic for me. But, um, and in the comics, you'd routinely get a story that's set in well the time it's being written. So we'll say the seventies, but then someone will cut about with a piece of technology that they couldn't possibly have had in the seventies because it's a comic book world full of geniuses like Tony Stark who can invent these things. You know, um, so it could be a similar sort of thing here. And maybe as the episodes go on and we see them outside a bit more, we'll start to see technologically speaking, when the, how this world looks and, I don't know, might get a date on a newspaper or something like that tells us when it's set. Because I think surely with what they've done, even so far, says 70s though, because when he was outside that time, the the clothing was 70s. The hospital that they picked, I've forgotten what it's called, but that, that building could not have been picked for being more 70s. And mm. I, I admit it takes a while for people to redecorate inside, but I feel like they've gone pretty far with with the with choosing the say the exterior of the building to, to make it look like it is the 70s and people's yeah. clothing when they're outside you know they they were all wearing the big coats and their the, the funky lapels and their and their, and, their, and, their, and the, 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 the the flat cap that the one of the rescuers was wearing mm. definitely 70s and you yeah. would stand out like a total idiot if you were the only one dressed like that <laughs> Yeah, it could be like Gotham in a sense where it's just, you know, it has its own kind of timeless quality where people dress how they like and and there's sort of a style to it, but not quite, um, you can't quite pin it down into any given time period. True. Yeah, they could go that way. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it could give it a bit of a timeless quality so that if you're watching it in 20 years, it'll still look kind of stylistic and, and it'll still fit whatever period you happen to be watching it in. As long as the themes are still relevant, of course. Yeah. In that case, I'd wonder why they picked the 70s, whether it was just a, a hail back to some origin or story or the, the most popular version of the comic or something. I don't, I don't know what they would be doing with that, though, if they were picking that out. Because Gotham's 40s very much fits with police and mm. noir and investigation. That that's an, That's a known and accepted association, whereas... If you're saying, let's evoke the seventies, what do you, you know, what do you try and what emotion or what feeling are you trying to bring out? Yeah, and it will be hard to tell until 
see more of it really how the world kind of shapes up in terms of how it how it looks and how technology is and how people are behaving and how other people are dressing because we do get a kind of confined view of the outside world in this episode and we can't completely trust it as well because of uh, David's mental state true true yeah. I mean, he was stuck in the 70s, which is possibly an insanity by itself, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but it looks great. I mean, there's nothing, no two ways about it. It just, uh, it doesn't look like any other superhero thing I've seen on television. You know, it's very um, bright, colourful, vibrant, very kind of stylistic, well, as I said. Well, one of the things they definitely did well, and I think this is about the whole episode, was give you... David's perspective at all points when he's on camera, when he's not, when he's dreaming, when he's awake, it's always uh, a cacophony of noise. Well, it's not a cacophony, that's unfair, but there's a, there's a lot of noise to keep you distracted. There's a lot of colors to keep you distracted. There's a lot of skipping around to keep you distracted. You can't focus in the same way that he can't focus. And it keeps that faithfully. There's, there's not a point where that breaks. And it seems very important for them to do that if this is going to be a character piece. Yeah, brings you into his madness. Yeah, absolutely. Or lack of madness as it is. Well, yeah, I think I think he is just very stressed and he, he's yeah. having trouble handling it. I don't think he has a strong mental disability or even that strong a mental disorder. I think he's just been led down this path of belief that turns out to be untrue and then he he does have a uh, a disorder that comes in like anybody who is heavily stressed mm. equally the fact the fact that he's on medication as well the medication fighting his uh, abilities could be what's causing a lot of the mess and the confusion in there is he when we see people talking a lot of the time are we hearing what they are saying or what they're thinking yeah and that that kind of thing I, I think is really interesting in the way it's it's being played. And as he comes off of his medication, or if he comes off his medication, what what's going to happen then? And how's our uh, how our view of that universe going to change? The insane asylum setting was really good for that as well because it you know it can be very surreal and anything can happen and people can behave off you know completely. I don't want to say inhumanly, but you know they'll they'll behave in ways that people wouldn't consider normal. So you, you see them have a lot of kind of bizarre conversations with people, and there's kind of an unreality about the whole thing, where it doesn't quite feel real at any point, even though it might be. Something I was very pleased that they did actually around that was the I'm going to say respect, and I'm not sure that's the right word, but I'm struggling for a better one. The respect they gave a mental institution because the one thing that bothered me about uh, Gotham's mental institution and to be fair quite a lot of shows that try and show you what it's like to be in somewhere where people are all insane is they they make it over the top and just clown like people come up and will be dressed like a um, a rabbit and they'll wave a flower in the face and say my granny keeps eggs and then wander off and it's it's this really disrespectful attitude to mental illness because it makes it seem as i say like a circus yeah and these the mental illness when you're surrounded by people in it feels like it should be something that's truly disturbing because these people are displaced to their own reality that you can't understand and when they try and communicate with you you probably have a lot of difficulty with it but it shouldn't be ridiculous and i think if you look around the i wish i could remember the name of the hospital now but the, the institution that they're in the hospital that they're in there were people who were staring into space there were people who were caught in manners of behavior that they were repeating but nobody felt ridiculous you know, and I think that is a level of respect that I'm pleased that they tackled, especially because it's going to be about a character who has a mental illness. Yeah, or doesn't, is the case. Maybe. Or doesn't, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you, the most of the focus for the kind of mental illness side of things comes from 
the Sydney character uh, and the the Lenny character. Um, although I think the Lenny character is the most the closest to the thing you're talking about, the clownish kind of persona. But even she is kind of she has these moments of lucidity and she has these kind of moments of being completely off the wall and she just kind of says what she thinks all the time, which, um, and, and it does feel slightly progressive in that way because she is clearly someone who is a bit more well-rounded than your average mental patient that you'll see in, in, in any TV show, really. Um, yeah, I think you get the feeling with, was it Lenny there? She was, she's somebody who is, uh, not necessarily, got a, 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 an identifiable mental disorder that you could pick out. It might be that she's just been, I don't know what she was supposed to be actually, but she, I don't think she was disrespectfully played either. Mm. Um, so I don't think, I wouldn't have even said she was clown. Like I was, she was more somebody who was just very disrespectful, who didn't hold back, who didn't have any uh, inhibitions anymore. So something about her had, had broken through, her need to be socially acceptable um so that that feels like it is a reasonable thing uh, and not not too not clown like uh, yeah yeah i i don't think she was clown like but she was probably the closest out of all of them but i think that's just because she had more screen time than than anyone else no maybe or than a lot of people at least in the first half of the episode because of her gracious exit in the second half really i assume sid was a total plant though wasn't she i mean i think the point of the plot was that she wasn't insane at all it was that she'd had a somebody must have faked up a medical uh, document to get her accepted in to the institution but she wasn't actually insane she just had to play act it by saying never touch me turns out for good reason but you know, it was. It, it, I don't feel like she was supposed to be unable to deal with that to the extent of a mental disorder. Yeah, she was essentially recruiting him. That was her role. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Chris, what do you think of the whole role of mental illness in this in this show? I mean, it's a topical thing at the moment because there's all sorts of initiatives to try and remove the stigma to, about mental health. So, uh, bring it into a popular TV show and making it the kind of focus through manifesting superpowers is is quite an interesting way to do that i think i think it's an interesting way of doing it i think you're right they didn't they weren't disrespectful in their way of doing it it's it's an interesting angle to have uh, i mean i already mentioned earlier on the podcast things like mr robot and things there's, there's a few tv shows now that have played mental illness in interesting ways and it'll be, well, I'm going to say the word interesting again, just to keep up the tally, uh, to see how <laughs> it pans out later on. Yeah, David goes on a journey through the episode where he kind of starts to accept his his abilities when he starts to, where things ha- start to happen that he, you know, he's positive have actually happened, like the whole body switching thing. That was the, I would say that's a big turning point where he starts to accept that um, maybe he isn't as crazy as people keep telling him he is. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to deal with that uh, body switching thing, though I couldn't decide in the end what was his power and what was hers, because there's that scene where she, the body, even though it's his mind, is having a drink in an outdoor cafe, and then when the waitress walks past him, it's him outside, as in the body and his mind, and I couldn't get my head round, hang on a minute, so if the minds have stayed in the same place, that means the bodies have physically transported places. Now, I could believe that because if he is going to be one of the most powerful mutants in all the world, I see no reason why he couldn't switch the bodies back and get inside everybody's mind around them to make sure that they didn't think that was a bad thing. But I didn't think it was supposed to be that. So I, I did I, get I lost that at that point. A, I thought that was just a visual cue to kind of tell you that that's, it's definitely him, you know, there, even though... It's kind of the audience sees him, but it's definitely her body kind of thing. Right. Okay. But that, in that case, I'm still I'm lost as to how on earth he got back into his his real body, given that yeah. she must have run off with it. But I guess that's yeah. not important because it's about insanity, and he doesn't know. So why should we know? But who then turned up at the house of his sister? If yeah. He- 
<laughs> so, but by that point, it has to be his head and his mind, or the sister would have freaked more than she did. So, yes. But the intervening period between those two points, anything could have happened. Yeah, it seemed there was a bit of a disconnect in that because yeah, that kind of confused me slightly. But the um, I don't know. It seems to jump straight to or pretty quickly to the whole um, him talking about the experience or well I mean it's kind of flashback-ish because he's talking about the experience and then we see it so maybe the whole um, visual of him sitting at the the cafe is just uh, him telling the story about it was her body but it was me you know so from the yeah. storyteller point of view he sees himself if you know what I mean and, and given the nature of the madness that he has I think I'd be prepared to just buy into that yeah it, it does a lot of playing around with that though I mean it, there is a lot of the the visual language that you can't really trust. I think you know that's it, it's quite mind bending in a lot of ways, which fits for a telepath who's just getting used to his powers. I don't know whether it was uh, when we're seeing him thinking he's her, if he's sort of projecting her image in his head over the top when he's you know because he's sort of assumed her powers and taken a little bit of her, whether that's the reason that we're seeing if that's making any sense at all <laughs> I, get what, I think I get what you're saying but in that case I'm not sure what's transferred because it seems like it's still his consciousness and his body, the only thing that she would have given him is her power set which sounds more like Ju- not Jubilee, Rogue um, yeah. so it's possible but yeah, I don't seems, think I can so bend my abil- head around that either. So her ability seems to be that she switches bodies with anyone who touches her skin. Because that's the whole hang-up about her not wanting to be touched. Mm. Um, Which just leads us back round to, at some point, they must have switched back into, and they must have both been standing in neutral locations whereby he couldn't learn where she was to to easily trace her and vice versa. Unless the effects are temporary. You know, it, well, uh, however it ended, purposely yeah. or accidentally, yeah, they must have both ended up in a situation where they couldn't use the information to trade uh, or to, to, to investigate the, the location of the other. Yeah. Yeah, confusing stuff. All right. Glad I didn't write a review of this. It would have been nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, David, good character. Uh, Dan Stevens is a great choice as well. He has crazy presence on screen. He's just He's been great in everything I've seen him in. I totally freaked out, though, when I realized who he was. I just had this strange moment that I thought, what? No, I can't handle that. You can't be the guy from Downton Abbey that just, no! And then I settled (laughs) down. But, yeah, he was good. Absolutely was he good. Um, I did wonder what was the, the, what was being, what he was picking up when he was written out of Downton Abbey because they said he wants to go to America to do other things. No way would I have ever considered what the one of the things he would like to do would be the next crazy superhero TV show. Yeah, um, and it seems like they've kind of got well, getting Dan Stevens as a kind of a prestige grab because his film career is starting to grow as well. Um, which probably, I think the whole eight episode thing attracts actors that want to do films and things because it's less of a commitment than than longer form series. So. Um, getting him was a good catch because I've seen him in quite a few things. Uh, the Guest was probably the the first thing I ever saw him in, and I thought he was brilliant in that. He does he's it's kind of an actiony thing, which is quite cool. But uh, in this, he does the kind of tortured telepath thing really well, and and he's he's able to be quite witty as well. So there's you know there's a good lot of range there already. It's only been an hour of screen time. Absolutely. It looks like yeah. a great choice from the first episode anyway, so it'll be um it'll be good to see how it pans out. He did great in that first episode, I think. Sort of play it the way he played it. Yeah. And I think it's sort of a double edged sword because they focus so much on, on David and uh, different perceptions of him. I think the other characters sort of suffer a bit. I mean it's only the first episode, but um Sydney, for instance, or Sid as IMDB calls her um, she's kind of she's only there to do what she needs to do for this episode and then she's gone well not gone but then she kind of fades into the background as needed So, but we don't really learn a lot about her other than she's terrified to be touched 
They are all supporting characters, though, at the moment. Yeah. It, it is his show. And I think if they'd have spent a lot of time detailing these other characters at the point where we're trying to learn what it is to be David, that would have been a mistake. Yeah. And I quite, obviously we quite expect to see a lot more of her in the future episodes if she is going to be prominent, but, yeah. but absolutely wouldn't want her to have seen any more of her at this point just because it's, it's not her show. This isn't a team. Yeah. Well, I assume it's not a team show, but. Well, but certainly the, the first episode wasn't. Yeah, the end of the episode could be interpreted as he sort of joins a version of the X Men. Aye. Yeah. When and at which point it would seem much more appropriate to then go into, well, who are these other people? You yeah. know, the two that rescued you are more than just uh, an angry girl and a guy with a gun. Yeah. And and the woman you fell in love with is obviously got to be more interesting than just someone you can't touch, even though you really want to. Yeah. And I like the way they played around with that as well, where they were walking around with the, um, was it the tie? Yes. So, you know, at length they were holding hands and they had the, the big pillow in between them putting up the barrier. It, um, it reminded me of Pushing Daisies in that way. No, I don't know that, I'm afraid. Um, I've not seen much of it, but it's basically um, by touching people, he kills them or brings them back to life. So he sort of brings his girlfriend back to life, but if he touches her again, she'll die. So they have to kind of hold hands through... Um, through cling film and things like that. So it reminded me of that a little bit. Uh, I assume Aubrey Plaza as Lenny is going to have to come in um, a bit more in the other episodes, but given that she's now part of his psyche, I I don't know how much she'll be developed, actually, because she's going to be a complete construct. So we can't really then go into her backstory yeah, unless he somehow absorbed her consciousness or something. But the, uh, yeah. Yeah, it does seem like she'll be the kind of angel or devil on his shoulder. Um, I suppose a bit like in Battlestar Galactica, where you've got six uh, influencing Baltar all the time. It could be like that. Yes. I mean, that's definitely the way it seems to be when he's in his uh, sister's basement. Yeah, but it's the sort of impression that you're getting that you, that she's going to sort of hang around as the as the conscience, as the influence in the background. Yeah, she'll just talk to him about stuff that as it's happening, and there'll be scenes where he just yells at her, and people are like, "What are you doing?" There's no one there. On that thought, actually, that scene technically does count as exposition, I suppose, but. One thing that I was very pleased with, well, what the one thing, one of the things I was very pleased with about this show, just the one, was that lack of need to explain when she was actually saying, this is what's going to happen next. So we, the audience, knew it didn't feel wrong or out of character. It was something that we could have guessed and he himself could have put together and it, it, isn't used too much i didn't i don't want to call it exposition because i didn't feel it was that i just feel like technically it might have been but and the fact that this show was confident enough that we were going to enjoy it by presenting everything as a mystery and at no point did some doctor have to come on and say and this is the thing that is wrong with you and it's for this reason and there are other people in this world like you know that was all ditch there was none of it and i'm much happier with that there are mysteries there are things that aren't certain there's that bit about the cafe scene that we've just debated for a few minutes and couldn't get to the end of it but we don't need to and i don't want it i'm much happier with the fact that there are that 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 was all left and they didn't need to fill in the gaps for us in some lame way yeah and it almost um works as a kind of introduction to the whole x-men concept if you've never seen it as well Because it's about halfway through the episode before the word mutant is mentioned. And then it doesn't tell you what a mutant is. Although you can work out what a mutant is based on the fact that he has powers and they call him a mutant. So, um, But they don't really go into, you know... It accesses our our assumptions well enough as well. Most of the audience probably has encountered either the old cartoon, the new films, a comic book, something online. So throwing it out there... Is, is clever enough that it just allows them to use even just the small amount of information we've probably gleaned, and it doesn't need to then explain what mutant is, because 
probably most people do know there there is just so much superhero stuff out there now you if you're interested enough to watch this show you probably have picked up what mutant means already yeah it's just interesting how it doesn't make you or it doesn't make the assumption that um that everyone's going to be hitting the ground running with it it takes a while before it even identifies itself as as something affiliated with x-men i suppose and it doesn't really and doesn't need to. It yeah. doesn't need to affiliate with anything. It is going to be fine as it is. You may get that further in the next episode. I mean, now that he's he's going to be around other mutants, uh, there might be a further explanation. But I think it's good that they've kind of assumed a little bit of knowledge in the first place, and they're not spelling everything out right away. Yeah. How long until the Hugh Jackman cameo? <laughs> <laughs> he'll be I don't know. He'll be drinking a beer in the background or something. Well, are they going to go down the route that he is Xavier's son? I mean, I don't know much about this comics at all. I, I, I've researched a little bit just because I couldn't resist. But yeah. is that something that's going to happen, do you think? Legion isn't really mentioned in the, the episode as a name at all. So um, I'd say they're going to keep their distance from it, but the episode doesn't commit to anything because you only see his mother, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't well, see his I, father I don't know all. who she's supposed to be. I didn't know if that was what she was supposed to be or not, actually. They give you a name, but I didn't recognise the name Bird. Would, I guess, was that an Easter egg for those that did know that his mother's no, name is... No, I don't is... think so. Uh, I, right. I'll admit I haven't... I'm not 100% familiar with the character because it's been a while since I've read anything he's been in, but uh, I'm sure he says Mom at the start when she gives him the cake. Oh, right. I'm sure, she, I'm sure he does. Maybe he doesn't. I anyway, think I've mistook those as two different characters actually I think I did because the, the dark haired woman when she's younger mm. and the older woman is, is, a, is a blonde I think I failed to connect the faces as being the same person you've just done that for me <laughs> um, so it's, his kind of parentage is kind of left open I suppose and maybe it'll be maybe it won't even be this season if it gets more seasons it could be something that him meeting his father is something that they do in two or three years time uh, as becomes necessary, you know. As shows go on, you start more families start coming out of the woodwork. Or maybe they'll do what uh, Supergirl did for a while: mention this other character vaguely in passing, and then not bring them on screen. Which I know, I know Supergirl now has brought Superman on screen, but I'm sure for a while that was a debatable point. They just mentioned Superman. Yeah. They could just have it, your car- your father. Oh yeah, your father. He never did use hairbrushes and so on, and <laughs> leave it in as. You know, yeah, and then eventually Patrick sense. Stewart turns up. Well, yeah, they could, <laughs> <laughs> or some cheaper bald guy that they oh, maybe they can afford. I don't know. Uh, Chris, do you think they'll go down the whole Xavier Sun route? I mean, you didn't um, know any, you didn't know that until now. I, I imagine. I, well, that, that's the thing. Spoilers. I've, spoiler. <laughs> uh, I've not read any of the comics, so I'm not. I don't. No, if they would or not. I mean, it, it, like you say, they could go down the Supergirl route where they're waiting until they form confidence, like I said earlier on. You know, they don't want to bring any of these characters or tie the universe up too much until they go, oh, this is working really well. Let's let's allow them to have some other characters and some other bits of the universe to play with. Mm-hmm. Or they go down the line and go, you know what, we're going to write this in our own sort of way. Even in the film universe, they didn't go along the Magneto and Quicksilver route until the most recent film, they hinted at it. Yeah. In the um, and then did nothing with it. <laughs> then did nothing. Yeah. Then did very little with it. Acknowledged it and did very little. So I, I don't know whether they'll do it or not. If they are deviating a little bit from the comics, then you never know, really. Yeah, and based on the um, sort of based on the the way that the the show is structured it seems like it certainly seems to me like the government bad guys are the only people that really know that mutants actually exist because well i mean you get a limited perspective on it but they they only really talk about it in clandestine situations i was trying to remember from this the sort of re you know the re canoned films whether it was it was the cuban missile crisis that brought them to the eyes of the government wasn't it yeah supposedly so if this is the 70s, which is still debatable, obviously, then you won't have had the football stadium yet, which mm. was the public eye opener. Yeah, that's true. It could be. Yeah, if it is set in the 70s, 
with random iPad things, then um, it it could be before that big coming out thing. Yeah. So, so it does tie in a little bit that the government are aware, but the public aren't necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a strange one. Uh, I think links to the wider universe are probably... It's probably too early to speculate about things like that, and I imagine there'll be little references here and there as the episodes go on. Uh, I, I didn't really pick out any references in this episode, and I usually do, but the, the only thing is really the X over the, the title card. Mm. Uh, and the mention of the word mutant, of course. Uh, would yeah well yeah and and it yeah to to to, to restate that before they didn't need anything to make it more enjoyable so maybe they'll actually just leave it there yeah could do and it'd be okay if they did I think I mean it's it, it seems to be working so far and I think if they go out their way for sort of cameoing characters and putting stuff in the background if they do it subtly I think it would be okay I yeah. think if they go over the top with it people go right enough already. Yeah, plus I think there's another sort of X-Men TV show in, in development that might be a bit more traditional X-Men type storytelling based on what I've read about it, which isn't much. Uh, but it's about a couple of kids who get recruited into a school, I think. You know, the, the, the sort of standard X-Men starting point, I suppose. Whereas this isn't. This is an adult who's been blind to his powers for years and now suddenly gets to um, gets to know them a bit. And uh, I found it interesting that the bad guys are essentially dealt with in this episode. Pretty much. I mean, nobody survives, do they? Like, but they are just government agents. It's, yeah. it's po- quite likely that the the real leader of whatever government faction it's going to be just hasn't even been introduced yet. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, although surely the the man who carves the dogs, surely he survived, so he can turn up later. Yeah. I mean, if that isn't a setup for future plot, then nothing is. <laughs> You've yeah. got a guy that was watching everything on the monitors. You've got the guy, like you say, the guy that was carving his dogs or his wolves. Mm. Yeah, that, that's there to come back. Plus, whatever agency this might be, you've got no doubt that that's going to play some part later on. Yeah. yeah, and the government agents were just kind of the the threat at the end. It's like in a superhero film, you know, where you've got two-thirds of the film is just kind of plot, and then the last third is this uh, oh, action sequence, I suppose. I mean, it didn't really do that. It was all around the electricity and the pool thing, but it gives you an idea of how powerful he is as well. Well, seeing as you mentioned that, that was one of the things I wanted to bring up, actually. I wondered if this show is going to commit to this guy being a class A power. I, f- I forget what phrase I'm supposed to use. Is it Omega, Omega level? level. And, yeah. I mean, are they, are they really going to commit to that? Because the problem with Flash, in my mind, at the moment, is that they will not commit to him being whatever DC refers to as that. Is that class A? I don't know, I don't know how to rank him in their own words. But mm. Flash is undoubtedly one of the strongest but the most powerful superheroes around by the power set that we've seen and by things they've introduced that he can do but he always conveniently depowers when they need the plot to overcome him in some way either by a problem or a villain that that needs to be able to defeat him and i i hate it i really hate it because it it feels like they're not committing to what he is it feels like a bit of a betrayal because i can't work out what the threat value actually is if the threat can suddenly overcome him when I feel like it shouldn't. There's no way I can ground myself in it. And I'm, I really want this show to say, right, this guy is supposedly going to be an Omega level mutant. And maybe he's not that way at the start because he's not got the control yet, but he's already been able to do things that are reasonably powerful and, I feel like it might be a challenge to give him threats that he can't overcome, but I would like them to try and commit to it or just not do it at all. They could just keep him low level and say he can't control it yet. And I'm I'm sort of okay with that, but whichever way they go, I'm desperate for them to commit to it. Yeah, I'm, guess, I'm getting the impression that his biggest conflicts will be internal. Yes. Uh, so it'll be about, you know, maybe the 
Aubrey Plaza voice in his head is something that you can't deal with very easily, or um, you know he can't control his powers. So, it, I mean, you see plenty of that when he destroys the kitchen and so forth. You know, it's, yeah. he kind of knows how he maybe knows how to activate it, but he doesn't know how to focus it, so it's too dangerous for us to use him around people. But they they kind of have to, in order to test that or test his level of control, you probably need to get villainous mutants in there somewhere that are challenging them in some way but at least well, on a physical level I'd rather they didn't actually I'd think I'd rather they kept it the, the original Superman route where they put him up against a Lex Luthor where this person stands no chance whatsoever in a power off you lose oh you yeah. lose again and you lose constantly but as you say if they could as you said if they could do things where the villains manage to trick him or if they realize he's got this internal monologue with this character, if they somehow manage to play on that and force him into this monologue, uh, then I think that would be uh, equally as interesting. I think his biggest weakness will be that mental instability, like you say, that voice in his head. Initially, it's going to be the control, but ultimately it's going to be he's not going to know who to trust. You know, who, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in his head? at that mm. particular time because you're going to end up with a very very loose cannon you know with a lack of control mm-hmm. you know he's going to be an omega level threat for want of the better uh, term to everyone because they don't know who he's going to fire at yeah uh, the omega level threats are always problematic in, in the comics because it's it's kind of okay this is about as powerful as it gets how are we going to deal with this and then there's usually a contrivance involved in actually dealing with it um, you can just look at X Men Three for that example. Uh, I'd rather not, but yeah. yes, you're right. Yeah. Or the yeah. last X Men film, you know. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. well, yeah, acknowledging that it is actually really difficult to do in the plot. But I think in that case, if you if if they don't think they can do it, I would rather they just retreated from it completely and not try. Don't put Superman on stage yeah. if you can't deal with his power level and you can't think of a plot for it you know? yeah and it's like I said the, the second episode is really the first episode as far as I'm concerned so I think they um, will get a feel of what the show is going to be in the next episode rather than this one because this one was all, it was pretty much the getting him out of the asylum getting him into getting him on the path he needs to in order to develop in the way that he needs to and now that he's done that there's time to um see what the show is actually going to be about yeah I'm definitely looking forward to it I have to admit yeah and, um, is there really anything else to, to talk about I mean we've kind of discussed the plot and we've discussed the characters in some ways um, I think the first episode was quite tight in how, uh, how focused it was on, on uh, I want to say Dan I keep thinking Dan but David got the same first initial which is kind of annoying but they um yeah they kept it focused on him which was the right thing because the show's about him and the kind of other elements sort of bled in so i think as a little self-contained story about a mutant discovering that he has powers and and gets essentially recruited into the x-men in inverted commas um it works whether it whether it will be a good setup for a series remains to be seen can we mention the dance number? I, I don't know what I want to say about it. I just I just really want to mention it and get it involved in it. Somebody say something about the dance number. Oh, did, what about that dance number, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a strange yeah. moment where all of the actors are suddenly on stage having hilarious fun, and all of their grins were so wide as if they all knew they were doing something slightly naughty, but let's just go with it. Yeah, but it kind of works... Um, Again, with the whole uh, heightened reality thing, it works completely. It works really well. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> but the whole um, and it, yeah, it works in context, whereas it just doesn't feel like a complete departure from what this show is supposed to be doing. I remember when Agent Carter did a, a song and dance number in one of the last episodes. It was just at the start of the episode, and it just didn't it didn't feed into anything whatsoever. That was a uh, that was problematic, but there it's kind of makes sense. Plus, Thank it was you. fun. I feel <laughs> I feel I feel better now. We've mentioned the dance number. I, feel like <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's completely lunacy. It's complete lunacy. But you know, right. it's, but uh, it's but it's something that could 
feed in later on. I'm not so much saying that there's going to be a dance number each week, <laughs> <laughs> but if if this is the kind of hallucination or thought that's running through his head, it it leaves little surprises that might just happen throughout. Pretty much makes as much sense as anything else that happened in the episode, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it wasn't out of place. It was the right thing to do at the right time, and it was a bit of fun. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Something for people to talk about. All right. Apart from in the last five minutes of the podcast when we almost forgot about it. Yes. It completely it slipped in. my mind, actually. No! <laughs> no, we got it in. It was good. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think we've pretty much covered it. I don't think we've been all that well structured, but, you know, we've, we've talked about Legion. We've kind of not understood some of it understood some of it looking forward to next week or this week tomorrow yeah i liked it i'll keep watching it i'll probably get enough out of it to watch another seven episodes uh yeah actually i'm i'm I, right i need to stop calling it the marvel stuff but uh <laughs> what can i call it? the fox stuff the fx stuff I can't remember the fox it marvel <laughs> the fox marvel there we go i i think it's 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 up there and it's promising to be one of the 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 more interesting of the shows because it is not just saying here's a superhero here's the story of the week oh and by the way there's an overarching plot villain that needs to be defeated it 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 feels like it is going down the route even if disconnected in terms of production company from things like um jessica jones and luke cage where they're, they're, they're trying to do something different from from super villain of the week and i i, I think that gives good promise for what's coming be interesting to see what i say at the end if they have gone to super villain of the week but but i think the promise of something good is definitely there there you go stay tuned listeners there'll be more chat about where the show is going uh chris what were your uh, my closing I thoughts know. i'm I, the same as you guys basically you've, you've said exactly what i want to say at the moment it seems like it's going to be really interesting and different uh, hopefully uh, tomorrow proves that um, and you know as long as they don't sort of go down that stereotypical route I think there will be an element of villain of the week to some extent but you know I look forward to it yeah me too I'm interested to see how it goes it feels different to the other superhero shows for me and I, I, obviously there's a place for everything um, but also I don't want everything to be the same so it's it's good to at least explore this kind of alternate take on it for a little while at least so, yeah so I think that's that's all from me and that's all from him <laughs> <laughs> well we did it we did an unstructured review of Legion for chapter 1 so how did we do feel free to leave us feedback so that we can help improve or maybe just do more of the same thing on Special thanks to YouTuber 331 E-Rock for the supplied music. And if you happen to like what you heard here, then please do subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or any major podcast here. We hope to catch you in the next Neil Before Pod.